Hello, Peter. Thank you so much for joining me today. Buenos dias, Tim. Great to talk to you. <laughs> Great to talk to you, mi amigo para siempre in Mexico. Uh, <laughs> how are you guys doing? How, how are you holding up, Peter? Um, like everybody else, we're held up just in a different country in a different time zone, but uh, isolated, uh, working from home. Yeah. So far, so good. No major complaints. Great. I'm glad to hear that. And, and thank you so much for your time today. I'm excited to talk to you about a few important topics. But why don't we start with the, the topic before us? Uh, how, how is Mexico holding up? And tell us about the current business climate in Mexico. Uh, how are companies responding to the uncertainty and the difficulties prompted by COVID-19? Yeah, I think that it's a two-pronged question, Tim. And uh, from a social uh, impact, uh, living in Mexico City, a city of 23 million, we've been hit very hard with uh, COVID. Um, uh, it's hard to wrap your arms around a city of this magnitude. And then you compound that with the fact that uh, a big percentage of the Mexican economy is informal. Mm -hmm. And when I say informal, no one's writing paychecks. I'm talking about people who are working on the streets, uh, selling tacos, delivering newspapers, the mariachi uh, bands. All these folks uh, work day to day for their livelihood. And uh, there's no stimulus check that's going to reach them. And so they have to go to work. And uh, you see it still today, prevalent in public transportation, massive amounts of people riding around in, uh, in what basically turns into an incubator. Mm -hmm. And so we've been hit particularly uh, hard, um, more so in that sector of the economy. The private sector business environment has responded very positively. I mean, I've been working at home since February. Mm -hmm. uh, we've put in policies in place uh, with our company since February to work and protect yourself and isolate yourself since February. And it's done very well for us. And we've seen a lot of response uh, from other uh, uh, companies in the private sector. But looking at it from a macro perspective, uh, Mexico has a long way to go. Um, uh, we've had the same mixed signals coming from our government uh, about the efficiency of wearing a mask, social distancing. I'm starting to see a uniformity in messages, but it hasn't been that way. Um, uh, so we're still in for a bumpy ride, uh, but uh, I do see light starting to shine at the end of the tunnel. From a business perspective, it's been um, people have adapted. Um, uh, you and I are having a conversation between Bloomington and Mexico City, uh, and that carries forward in the private sector. Um, we don't miss a beat. In fact, it, people expect more from us. The days are longer, uh, the hours, it doesn't seem to stop. And so from a business perspective, uh, uh, we've learned to become more efficient um, uh, with our time. Um, uh, we're not stuck in traffic. Uh, we're very efficient in getting up to go, go to work. And uh, the timing has uh, been very, very productively used. Um, uh, from a business uh, climate environment, uh, aside from COVID, um, uh, we live in an environment today here in Mexico City with a new government in place for the last two years. It's very much a populist government, uh, doesn't trust the private sector that much. And so we've been battling a, uh, a twofold uh, battle here, not just with COVID, but with our uh, uh, federal authorities. Um, uh, so it's been a challenge for uh, the renewable energy sector. Great. Thank you, Peter, so much. So speaking of the renewable energy sector and your time um, involved in it, I'd love to hear a little bit more about both your experience in it, but then and now, what did it look like when you first entered that very unique space? And then yeah. as you sort of put your finger on the pulse of where it's at and, and where it may go in Mexico and throughout Latin America, or even globally, you'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Oh, absolutely. So I arrived back in Mexico City about eight years ago. And uh, eight years ago, renewable energy was taking a foothold. We had a, a very favorable business climate. Uh, the PRI, which was the party in power, was promoting the privatization of energy generation, which was very new. And they passed the energy reform law. 
and that allowed uh, foreign entities to participate in energy generation. And uh, what ended up happening is that over the course of these last eight years, six, seven years, we've been able to put in place the uh, a phenomenal amount of wind farms and solar sites throughout Mexico, generating the lowest cost of energy literally in the world um, uh, through, through uh, auctions. And uh, it's been a phenomenal environment, very inviting, very pro-renewable uh, energy. And uh, boy, fast forward uh, eight years later with a new change of government uh, and Manuel Lopez Obrador, our current president, does not share those same sentiments. Um, uh, he is very much uh, wanting to go back to the old days of uh, CFE, which is the government controlled monopoly utility company. And also to rebolster Pemex, the big uh, oil company here in Mexico. He wants to build those back up and make them uh, what they were in the past, which were uh, corrupt, the largest entities in, in the country, multiple levels of bureaucracy, uh, a lack of transparency. Uh, but yet he believes that that is the only way forward to protect the long-term interest of energy in Mexico. So the climate has changed very quickly. And I would say that it has changed since this year. And he, uh, this government has taken advantage of COVID by putting in policies in place to prevent new wind farms and to prevent new solar sites from, be, from coming online and halting investment uh, in those sectors. And so it's been a challenge. It, it truly has been. And uh, I tell you, one of the advantages of working with a global company is that you're not limited to just one market. And so part of the adaptation process has been to capitalize on the infrastructure that we have here in Mexico, uh, which is an office of about 45 individuals, and looking to develop, uh, be forward thinking and looking to develop other markets in Latin America. And so while Mexico is not an attractive uh, environment today, oh my gosh, Brazil is exploding. Mm. Colombia is thriving. And so a lot of the uh, human capital that we have today is focusing a lot of time in supporting uh, those particular markets. Mm. And uh, we've adapted and uh, we're still moving forward with certain projects in Mexico, but not without going through a lot of legal hoops. But today, I'm bringing back my Portuguese skills, uh, Tim. I'm, I'm on Zoom calls with uh, folks in Brazil and talking about opportunities in renewable energy in the northern section of Brazil. And uh, also talking about development of solar sites in Chile. Mm -hmm. And so that is part of the wonder, uh, beautiful aspect of uh, energy is that it has a global demand. It has a global marketplace. Mm -hmm and finding folks with that ability to transverse and cross borders and cultures uh, makes it a real dynamic uh, environment for us. Thanks, Peter, so much. Appreciate uh, your insight there. As we talk a little bit more about the importance of relationships, uh, the importance of relationships on the global stage, I wanted to touch on the U.S.-Mexico relationship. We, we need each other so very much, and we are better and stronger as we leverage this important relationship. I wonder if you'd share some thoughts with us about our relationship moving forward and important pathways for us as we work to strengthen the relationship between US, the U.S. and Mexico. A absolutely. And so... I'm a globalist, Tim. I believe that uh, where you have international trade, you will not need soldiers on that border. Um, uh, you're creating partnerships, and hopefully those partnerships are a win-win situation for both uh, the consumer and the producer. And Mexico is in a, has a tremendous advantage in that we share a common border and we're close to the American marketplace. And Mexico provides an ample amount of uh, labor, uh, skilled labor, has a tremendous uh, domestic market itself. Um, uh, we've always been dependent. Mexico has always been dependent on the U.S. economy. If 
the U.S. economy uh, catches a cold, the Mexican economy is in the hospital on a respirator. <laughs> it's been that way for a long time. We've been very attached. Now, recently we've diversified a little bit, but it's still the relationship is very, very important. Um, uh, the political climate has changed recently. And uh, I tell you that when you talk about a wall and you talk about uh, immigration, drug trafficking, those are certainly uh, hurdles and obstacles that we have to go, that we have to cross, mm. but we have to cross them together. Mm. It's, it's not going to happen because Mexico puts in policies in place to prevent that from happening. No, it has to be mutual and policies have to be put in place on both sides of the border um, uh, to stem the flow of drugs, to stem the consumption, to stem the manufacturing to develop programs to uh, improve the quality of life and opportunities in Mexico and South America. It's only going to be through bilateral collaboration will we be able to address these problems together. I see a tremendous opportunity for the Mexican-U.S. relationship. Um, uh, I think this COVID uh, environment really brought to the attention the dependency on China in the U.S. economy, having all your eggs in that basket, wow, it's, you run huge risks. Mm -hmm. And so I've spoken to a lot of business folks in the States who are actively pursuing ways to diversify their, um, their production needs and not having everything in the hands of the Chinese. Well, Mexico is a great partner for that. And uh, I see a tremendous opportunity to build bridges of collaboration and production uh, exchanges between our two countries, short term. I see that happening quickly. And uh, they recently, the president of Mexico visited uh, the, uh, the United States and all messages that were coming out were very positive very positive. Let's try to turn those words into actions. But I think that there's a bright future for both countries if we work and see trade as a way to improve our relationship long term. Um, uh, you'll see goods going north, uh, Americans coming south to visit. Uh, when those things happen, wow, our, our relationship will blossom. Mm, I certainly like the sound of that, Peter. Thank you. Well, sure. one other topic, too, I want to be sure to take advantage of you since we have you here today with us. Um, you've had a, a global career and a successful one, Peter, and I know you always bring people along with you. Uh, I have... Uh, been a fan of yours for longer than you realize. And when uh, we finally got to meet back in February in person and our discussions, they've been, um, uh, they've definitely built me up and, and have been important uh, during this more difficult time that we're all experiencing. But I wanna talk a little bit about advice because I know you have such good advice to share. So for those who are seeking a global career in business, Peter, what are your thoughts and, and share some of your advice with us uh, as young people look to build their skill sets to be competent in the global business arena? Uh, anything you'd share with us today, it would be much appreciated. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I tell you, there is no more challenging and rewarding career than a career in international business. I'm a firm believer. It is not easy. It is riddled with challenges. But I sat in that classroom in Bloomington um, uh, back uh, in the uh, mid 80s. Um, uh, and I can tell you the things that took me from Bloomington and helped me traverse and develop an international career, I, I can list them for you. But uh, the most important thing is to have a global mindset. You have to be a person who values different cultures, who respects different cultures, who, who is open to diversity and willing to accept uh, that maybe our way is not the only way of doing business or of, of uh, executing a project. There will be different opinions across the board. Having a global mindset, respecting cultures, sustainability, diversity are key words but i tell you patience is goes a long way 
And uh, you have to be able to uh, not just talk the talk, but you've got to be able to walk the walk. Um, uh, one thing is you sit in Bloomington and you aspire for this stellar career and you want to work in Paris, yet you maybe have never left Martinsville. <laughs> and uh, you've got to be able to talk the talk. You've got to be able to show your potential employer that not only do you aspire for an international career, but you've done it. You've done it through study abroad programs. You've invested time in learning a foreign language, which to me is invaluable. I speak for uh, Tim. Um, uh, the more you can connect with that local culture, the bigger advantage you have. Um, uh, being able to adapt to a local environment is key. And uh, it is not easy. Let me tell you, when my wife got her first one-way ticket um, uh, and we went to Turkey, uh, it, was, it was a challenge for her at first. Um, but once we got there and we didn't speak the language and we were very new to the culture, we were there for a small amount of time, but uh, she learned to embrace it and she loved it. And those uh, six months, eight months that we spent there were fantastic. And we built a lot of uh, friends while we were there. Um, uh, buying that one-way ticket, you, you leave your comfort zone, your mm. family, your close-knit friends. They're not coming with you, but you have new ones to make in, uh, in that new environment. And it's going to test you. It's going to test your patience. It's going to uh, present problems that you will have to address and resolve in a foreign environment. And if you think that you're going to do that alone and not rely on a local team of managers and executives to help you make the right decision, wow, you're going to be in for a struggle. <laughs> and so uh, that adaptability, if I were a student today, I would tell you, focus. Uh, show me that you've learned a foreign language, that, you are in, that it, you, it is important to you. Show me that you've invested time in, a, in studying abroad, maybe even getting an internship overseas, even if it's the Peace Corps. I need to know that when I send an executive overseas, that it's a huge investment for a company to invest in that risk. Hiring the right person for that job, you've got to show me that you're going to minimize that risk. And you've got to be able to talk the talk and walk the walk. Mm -hmm. And so right now in college, foreign language skills, study abroad programs, potential uh, internships overseas. Those mean a lot to me from a potential employer, and it will help you develop the skills that you need to compete in a global marketplace. Great advice, Peter, as usual, and thank you so much. Uh, we are fortunate here at Kelly that our international global partners are always willing to share advice uh, with our students and with us. And I think we as educators, I think we're getting maybe a little bit better at what we're doing because so much of our focus recently has been about putting theory into practice and engaging the global community, the global business community. And so these experiential learning components that are not just discussing uh, a case that was created 20 years ago, tackling today's business problems in working with our global partners. I believe our students uh, take more from that as they prepare for global careers, but then you in the business community, community benefit as well because these young people come with great ideas, great enthusiasm, and that's, that's when it's that proverbial win-win, right, that we're all looking for. And I, I know yeah. in, in my time, and, it, and that was made so clear to me again when I was in Mexico back in February before all this unfolded, um, we really do need each other and we're all made better when we come together and, yeah. uh, and go after those things um, that, that are important to us and that bring people along with us while we're doing it. Oh, absolutely. You've got tremendous assets with alumni uh, scattered all over the globe. Uh, Tim, Indiana has, uh, we have 300 of them here in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, those, those individuals, a vast majority of them are leaders of industry. Mm. Our, we have the head of the banking system here in Mexico. We have the head of, uh, I think it was Toyota or Nissan. 
Um, uh, we have Google, we have Facebook, it, it, dentists, they're all over the map. <laughs> but uh, people who have invested their education, to take their education and study in the United States and then bring it out into the real world on a global scale. I tell you, those, those individuals are a special group and you'll find them usually at the head of the organizational chart where they work. Um, uh, they, they bring a tremendous skill set. They bring a tremendous background and education with them and, uh, and the experience that they, most of them bring to the table is, uh, unparalleled, uh, invite us back, um, uh, bring us into the classroom. Um, I don't think there'd be anything uh, more rewarding for a leader, uh, in industry here in Mexico to address a business classroom at, uh, in Kelly and talk about the banking industry or talk about a case study of a Mexican bank. Uh, I think that'd be a lot of big hoop for both parties. Sounds great. Let's do it. Uh, and, Let's do and it. Peter, I appreciate your time and thoughts shared with us today. Always a pleasure to connect with you and thanks for your unwavering and uh, fantastic support of the IU global community. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's uh, four best years of my life. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I carry it with me every day and uh, uh, I I'll always be a Hoosier. All right. Well, fantastic. Thanks again, Peter. And uh, we'll talk again soon. You bet. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. That's all the time we have for this edition of Cyber Focus. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any suggestions for future topics, please let us know at cyber, that's C-I-B-E-R, at indiana.edu.